20 minutes for questions, um, comments. Um, so I want to take a couple at a time, if that's OK. And if you could please keep it short um, to allow as many people as possible to speak. Um, so Ali, Alia, I'll start with Alia, then um, Ala. Anyone else? Um, Sebra at the back, and then the lady in the pink top. OK, that's four. Right. Um, thank you for the panel. It was really nice. Um, with the whole thing with ISIS, a lot of them are from my generation, and it's been really upsetting to see them go over there because I feel like I'm just looking at my own friends and my own like um, siblings. So what I want to say is uh, how, how do we kind of get it back into the head and, and pull them back from it? Because especially with the women, they've gone over as... Um, as, as sex slaves, really, like they, they don't even know it yet, and some are as young as 14. So, what can we do about? I, I know you didn't mean that, like they lost causes like that, but I mean, I, d I don't want to feel like they're completely lost to us. Like, how can we pull them back in and, and, and bring them to, the, to their senses? It's more of a comment and uh, maybe a proposal. You talk about uh, supporting people in Kobani, but you could first, at a small scale, right now, send a message via the peace in Kurdistan outfit would be supporting the Kurds in Turkey and organizing a delegation to the refugee camp there. Okay? So you can send them the message that was uh, mentioned earlier. That would be at least a small beginning. Um, thank you. I just have a comment on the, on the conference in general. Um, I'm a, I think there have been some wonderful speakers, some wonderful contributions, but I am as a feminist, a bit disappointed um, that I would ex have expected f a far more radical critique of religion. I'm sorry to say that because I know some of you are very much in favor of working with other religions, um, but as far as I'm concerned, um, misogyny has existed for five to seven thousand years. It's the basis one of, of, of um, patriarchy um, and religions. If you read Jack Holland's book about misogyny, um, religions are mainly to blame for misogyny, hatred of women, contempt of women. And I would have expected a far more radical critique of, of religions, organized religions. I'm not against spirituality, I'm not against um, believers, but I think we're not going to, we are never ever going to achieve full equality for men and women if we do not actually end up at some time in the distant future, I'm not talking about, you know, in two generations, but I would expect to see all religions on the scrap heap of history. And I say that as a historian because I think, you know, misogyny and a patriarchal society is what is keeping us from achieving human rights. Um, and I'm very disappointed that in the manifesto, the call for equal rights for women is 0.5 and not 0.1. And I would really... You know, because I think women's rights, some, some famous person said, you judge the development of society by the position of women. So if we don't put women's, the fight for women's right first, we, you know, secularism is not going to get us very many places because we've got to stop religions as being um, the determining point in society. And it's all very well to say, well, religion's private, but... So j j uh, okay. To other people, I want to open this up to as much discussion as possible. Thank you, and we will address your points. Thank you. Yeah, it's a very uh, relevant point, and, and I'm sure that there is a lot more work to do with that, but I would like to um, um, hear the panel members' opinions about something that is really, really frightening and, and bothering. Um, earlier today, I was saying that um, I was consulting the NATO as a political advisor in Afghanistan, and I stopped being that when the peace mission turned into a war mission. And, and um, since a couple of months, and also here on the panel, I have the impression that the only idea that we have is the Kurds have to go into the armed fight against ISIS and we only think and talk about the modalities as if we were accepting that killing is a solution to something, to anything. And, and I personally think that that is uh, we, we have run into a trap if we think like that. We have the United Nations, they do have peace missions, and I think that 
for against ISIS, the only military answer, if at all there should be a military answer against ISIS or anything like ISIS, it should be the United Nations that gives a military answer to them and not Kurds or whoever else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ala, 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 can we allow the, the panel to respond, please? Thank you. Right. Um, who wants to take um, the first point about what we can do about young people? Okay. Thanks so much. Um, I, I really feel what, for what Ali is saying. Uh, it's a very difficult question. Um, uh, where I was working uh, recently, and uh, I had a similar experience of people who were going to Syria to, to fight. At that time, I didn't know that, and I can't confirm that they actually joined ISIL, or uh, that's what they did. But uh, in hindsight, you know, they may have done, and they're quite young people. This has happened, you know, the r recruitment. Um, I don't know what can be done physically for those specific people, you know, who maybe at a, another time they may not have been recruited. But I, 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 I can understand what can be done on a sort of a long-term thing and what should not have been done. What should not have been done because what happened was this uh, honeymoon uh, with, the, with the Islam, Islamic, uh, the mosques, the Islamic forces here, which became a breeding ground for that. From the beginning, we heard from yesterday and today how education has been taken over. So, I mean, the first thing to do is uh, just uh, uh, get rid of all those recipes of the, uh, from the Tony Blair, and, and all, which has continued, the faith schools. Close down all these faith schools, for God's sake. <laughs> I'm going to exercise chair's privilege and just um, say something about some of the work that I've d um, been doing. I was chief executive of a race equality organisation at um, literally minutes away from where Lee Rigby was, was brutally murdered. We tried for so long to get the local authority, the politicians who visited, government departments, the schools in the area to speak to a race equality organisation, not to the mosque, not to the churches, not to any of the faith-based organisations. And they would not allow us to sit at the table. I somehow managed to get into a meeting with David Cameron and later with Ed Miliband and kept banging on about this point to pick up um, m you know, my colleague in the corner. The only woman in the room at both of those meetings, the only person not representing a faith-based organization. Since leaving that organization, I have continued to push for work in schools that addresses all forms of extremism. Unless you come with a faith-based badge, unless I stand up and say, I'm a Muslim woman from a Muslim organization who wants to take an Islamic approach to this, they will not let me speak. They will not let me listen. Since the bombings in 7-7, um, my son was attacked after the bombings, really badly attacked, and there was a Muslim women's talk campaign going around the country. I was the most senior Asian woman in policing at the time. I was not allowed to be part of those debates because I was not Muslim enough. That's, that's what we're up against. It is deeply, deeply worrying. This absolutely with Baharam on... Um, the end of faith schools. But how do you do it? How do you do it? And my children have left this country. My son will not return. This is breaking up families in more ways than them going to fight a jihad. Okay, right, I'm going to go on to the next question. Sorry, I'm very passionate about this. Um, right, the other questions. Um, does that answer your point about a more radical critique in terms of women and women's issues that they're just not allowed at the table, but we do, I think, need a, need a debate. Um, Gita, sorry. When I said a lost generation, I didn't actually mean those guys running off to war. Uh, I think there's everything to fight for there. And, uh, you know, our book, Double Bind, the book of the Center for Secular Space, Double Bind, the um, 
Muslim right, the, the Anglo-American left and universal human rights is about what the, in the security discourse you call a counter-narrative. Their counter-narratives are all within religion. We have to address people who have a sense of injustice and unfairness and unpick this, unpick where it comes from and where these ideologies come from. We're not gonna succeed all the time because f fascism has a certain pull. But that debate isn't even happening because the secular organizations that Yasmin was talking about, many of people who've been involved with that kind of left um, secular framework, I mean, Rumi, um, Kenan Malik, you know, Pragna Patel, uh, you know, me, we've all been involved with anti-racist organizing, Nira, you know, as well as work on secularism and fundamentalism. And, uh, there is that voice, and we've got to create it, because f for sure the state ain't going to give us the platforms, as Yasmin said. So I think those are there. On the critique of misogyny, well, yes, some people are going to be disappointed, because some of us campaign on religious fundamentalism, and I, as an atheist, work with Yasmin, who's a believer, and with many other, other of my colleagues who are uh, believers uh, of various kinds. So uh, my battle is not uh, about... Uh, tearing apart religion as such. I fully, absolutely support anybody's right to criticize religion and to say what they like about it, uh, and I will defend them if they get into trouble, but my battle is against religious fundamentalism in all its various varieties and the creation of secular space, because how do we, even if you want to unpick religion and misogyny, how do you create the space to do that unless you want to set up a fascist state yourself which sends every believer into a concentration camp? So what do we do? How do we live together? And, and the, the reason that we support a secular manifesto is that we have to live with people whose beliefs we don't agree with. But we have to find a way of doing it. Having been part of a movement for many years, after 1984, we set up a movement against communalism and it was focused on trying to deal with communal hatred and communal violence. We arrived very early on at the conclusion that this is not a struggle against religion. No religion has been wiped out by atheistic arguments and it's not likely to happen. Um, I myself cannot say that I'm a believer in any religion. At the same time, I cannot deny that in the movement that we had, there were m many people who were very, very staunch Hindus and Muslims and Christians. And they came into this movement to resist violence and communal hatred out of sheer decency. It's really, uh, it's insulting to tell them, you know, you, this is religion is open with the people and Karl Marx has said this, that and the other and science is going to replace religion. It's actually, you know, it's going to undermine you. Nobody's going to listen apart from the fact that it's a metaphysical question which we cannot settle. I don't believe that science is a substitute for religion. So it's, it's not some, so you need to create space for these arguments to uh, coexist with, with one another. Some of the most marvelous, wonderful people who have resisted communal violence are believers. I, I owe it to them to say it in so many words. It's absolutely marvelous people who remaining staunch believers tried to resist the the horrible uh, perversion of religion coming from within their own community. I respect those people and without them we would be nowhere. That's one point. The second point is I totally agree that the struggle against patriarchy and misogyny is actually very, very important and it's in fact right at the top of the battle because the, the fascism and, uh, and the kinds of movements that we, the, the kind of movement that of extremism that we see, the first focus that they have is always towards their own women. They always tell them how to dress, how to behave, what to think, what to do, what their place in society. So of course the struggle for complete and unconditional equality of women has to be at the top of any struggle for secularism. I totally agree with that. However, at the same time, you, you cannot tie that up with a battle against religion. You have to be able, for instance, in India, we have a secular constitution. There is nothing in the constitution which says that women have a second place or they should jolly well remain at home. In fact, civil society, the so social consciousness runs behind the, the legal f consciousness. It is behind the constitution. All you have to do in India is to say, please implement this damn constitution. We can show, actually, in, in, in India, we don't, I keep telling them to the Maoists. Incidentally, I was myself a Maoist. For two whole years, I was in the Maoist underground. Today, I tell them repeatedly, you don't need a violent revolution to overthrow the constitution. That's being done already by the fascists. You need a nonviolent revolution to defend the constitution. 
So it's possible to formulate a program of moder You cannot defeat fanaticism and extremism by more fanaticism and more extremism. You can only defeat fanaticism and extremism by a politics of moderation and love. Um, uh, just, sorry. I very much share the sentiment that, uh, of uh, Siba's uh, sentiment about how the question of women's rights is um, integrally tied up with, the, with religion. And, and the first uh, line of attack by the religious forces is women's rights, and we know that. I don't know of any religion which respects women's rights, actually. And especially Islam, and we know what kind of, uh, uh, you know, the havoc they're wreaking. And the question is not, I think the most important distinction that we have to bear in mind is not that we are not attacking uh, people, religious people. It's a question of attacking religious ideas. And it's not a question of uh, re religion as an ideology. You see, uh, you mentioned Karl Marx. Karl Marx at that time talked about uh, religion being the opium of the uh, people. I think it's gone much further than that. Religion is a big industry now, with billions of dollars uh, behind it, with the state supporting it. It's got the state power. And to defeat that, you can't, you, you can't just defeat it ideologically with enlightenment. You have to defeat it as a physical force, which is a huge menace. And, and so it is a, when they attack us, they say, oh, you're being Islamophobe. You're being against uh, Muslim people. Not at all. You're absolutely, there are so many Muslim people, the ordinary, we're not talking about the ordinary people who are themselves victims of this organized industry, this religion. And I think that is very important to bear in mind. That's why we should not shirk from attacking religious institutions, religious industry head on and go to the, right to the end, because unless we get rid of that, we won't have women's rights, people's rights, or anything else. Just a very brief comment. I mean, I think a lot of people in the audience where we were sitting uh, commented saying, you know, we can't believe there is single Buddhist nationalism, which is so violent because Buddhism is supposed to be peaceful, nonviolent, etc. And I think perhaps this is uh, perhaps the best example of how there's nothing in the religious texts, nothing in the teachings of the Buddha uh, which justifies what is going on. Uh, and the nationalists have used historical texts uh, about uh, Buddhism in Sri Lanka to, um, you know, wage this war. So. I guess what I want to say is um, really, again, religion is not the problem. It's the way religion is being used by these extremist groups, and Buddhism is the best example of that. Just one thing to add, I think. Uh, uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the critical uh, post-war issues have still not been resolved. People are living in camps. Society is militarized, and Northeast, the war zone, is, is an occupation army, is there. People's livelihoods is being disrupted. Fishers, farmers, home-based workers, displaced. So on top of this, that this um, convergence of political powers, extremism, Buddhist violence, defense security uh, agencies, the defense is controlling and pressurizing religious minorities also, imposing this singular Buddhist hegemony. So, and this is what we have to live with and address. Thank you. I'm going to have to draw it to a close there. Um, I didn't expect to be outed as a believer. Thanks, Geetha. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> It's a different kind of outing to the one that Kieran talked about earlier. Uh, I just want, again, want to say thank you to Mariam and Mariam A for organising today, um, to the panel, to all the speakers, but to all of you for staying the course. 
I think you can see by the emotion that's been displayed at various points through the conference just how much this all means to all of us. My kids haven't gone to ISIS, by the way. Um, <laughs> but anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasmin Rahman, for chairing this session.